So thanks so much for the for the invitation to be here and the introduction. It's my pleasure to uh, always share the Dhamma. And today I was asked actually to speak about grieving the loss of a loved one. So that's going to be our topic. You may already know that um, from the announcement. <laughs> And I think we'll start with some meditation. So if you would find a comfortable position. Give the body a chance to adjust and find a a position where the spine can be straight, but relaxed. And the whole body can be comfortable enough to relax and let go. Take a few deep breaths at the beginning. And with each exhalation, really invite more of that relaxation and letting go. It's as if the out breath is carrying any tension that we're holding along with it. Regardless of what time of day it is, if it's at the end of the day, then really setting aside everything that's been happening. For me right now, it's the middle of the day. I also set aside everything that's coming with me. <coughs> and just really be here, present. And also bring a sense of kindness to this moment. Because we'll be talking about some deep feelings today. The kinds of thoughts and feelings that arise when we lose someone we love. And also what the Buddha had to say about grief and grieving. And I find it's always really helpful to maintain an attitude of kindness and compassion for ourselves and for others whenever we open the heart, whenever, whenever we're doing anything really, anytime, but especially when feelings of sadness or loss arise or our reflection on those experiences that we've had or our concerns about those experiences that will come in the future. And then we can hold that all, including anything that might be happening in one's life right now that brings fear or regret or sadness or longing. A willingness to be present and aware 
and wise. Knowing what's wholesome and helpful and what isn't. So as we sit in meditation, put our attention on our meditation object. If that's the breath, breathing in, fully aware that we're breathing in, breathing out, aware and present, knowing that we're breathing out. Opening our awareness to include our entire body. Noticing any pleasant sensations arising in the body that come from relaxation and tuning in to the softer, more spiritual energy. Inclining in that direction. And also inviting the mind, the mind to become calm, to let go. Let go of any tension or stress. Just relax and feel what's happening right now in this moment. And if those sensations of tingling or warmth or fullness become quite strong, we can use that as a way to really go deeper, to enter into that experience of the body, you might say, and let go of what's happening in the mind. Allow any thoughts to become background, unimportant, and really focus on our breath.
Well, welcome to everyone who came in while we were meditating and welcome back from meditation. Um, although you didn't go anywhere, maybe, but <laughs> here we are again together. And as I said earlier, my, um, I was asked to talk about grief and uh, grieving uh, the <laughs> loss of someone we love. And about 25 years ago, I think it was, I was attending um, a spiritual gathering and there were about 150 people there. And the person who was invited to speak was the head of a large Buddhist hospice organization. And the first thing they did was ask, is anyone here actively grieving? And I was really surprised at how many hands went up. And he said, that's, that's always the way it is. You get any group of people together and there's some portion of them who are actively experiencing grief. And so sometimes I remember that, you know, even whenever talking with a group or um, even moving through our day, you know, we're likely to be encountering people who are experiencing grief, who have lost someone they love. And of course we grieve over other things too, but in that case, you know, someone we're really close to, um, maybe the most, um, the strongest of those experiences. And of course, there are every, every different um, grief experience and situation where we lose someone seems to be somewhat different. And being with people when they, when they have lost someone in their life or, or, um, are, are in the process of someone, someone's in the process of actively dying or passing away. Um, <clears throat> it's always a little different, you know, and it's a, it's a fairly unique thing. And we never really know how it's gonna go and we can't predict how we're gonna react, I think. We may or may not feel the way we expect to feel. Let's put it that way. And what's important about noticing this is to really bring as much kindness and compassion to the situation and to ourselves as we can. You know, sometimes people feel like they shouldn't feel what they're feeling. And that really is, um, it really inhibits our development, I think. It really inhibits our healing. And so first and foremost, to be accepting of whatever arises in us and accepting of the situation that's occurred. Now we'll talk about, you know, some, some situations where we may have to take some kind of action. I don't mean that we avoid that or anything, but this idea of really being kind, um, really having compassion for ourselves and everyone else involved is important. And within that context of kindness and compassion, to be able to be as much as we can present with feeling, present with this experience. And as I said, you know, it, it really hits people differently and at different times. <laughs> and it, there are many different contributing factors. For example, when my father died, um, that's a long time ago, it was 1990. Four. <laughs> it's a long time ago. And I had not met up with the Dhamma yet, and I was completely unprepared. 
his his whole family tended to live into their 90s or even over 100. And here he passed away at the age of 69. I'm just about to become 69 in about another six months. And um, at that time, people said, oh, it's too, he's too young, you know, I mean, almost 70. I think he's in his 70s officially old, right? But we weren't prepared at all <laughs> for that event. And, um, and so the shock and the, um, the grief my mother was experiencing, the shock for her, uh, was something I just wasn't prepared for. And I knew that I had no real ability to, I didn't have any idea how to handle it. But what I noticed almost immediately was I had to pull my awareness back to the present moment. Um, sometimes when you're feeling very strong grief or shock, then the way we can handle it is to not think at all about the future, just get through this 10 minutes, just get through this next hour. And there was a fair bit of that happening. And I still think that's a valuable way to cope when things are really, really challenging. Really, and, and all of you who have some experience with the Dhamma and you're practicing um, mindfulness and awareness, you know really well how to come to the present moment. And then you can use that when emotions are really strong or there's a lot kind of falling apart. And if we can just endure, walk through this next whatever it is, I can make it through the next 10 minutes, through the next half hour, through the next hour, through the next two hours, whatever you can, whatever, ex, whatever uh, kind of sort of space of awareness and um, you can, you can take in fine, you know, and then, and then it changes. So remembering that whatever we're feeling, it's impermanent. And we will figure out how to cope. We will figure out how to be with what's happening. Now, the advantage of having the Dhamma, of course, is huge because the Buddha really wanted us to prepare for this experience. He, he wanted us to reflect on death, really think about the fact that we're going to lose everyone we love. And sometimes when people haven't had much experience with the Dhamma, that sounds very depressing, <laughs> uh, frightening. But actually, once you get um, more of the exposure to Dhamma, you start to see that it's not depressing or frightening. It brings us into direct awareness of reality and in many ways that's freeing the more we realize the truth of the way things are the freer and happier we are and by the time uh, my mother died in 2017 so many many years later um, i was a bhikkhuni um, had been with people who were dying, have been, had been with um, people who, who had lost their family members a number of times and, and had some training in this regard and all of that, but still it's my mother. And it was through the practice and, and development of the Dhamma that it was a very different kind of experience for me to be able to sit next to her through this process and use the foundations of mindfulness to think about, to reflect on how her body and my body were the same, in many ways the same, and that I would also go through this process of death. 
And it was something, it's like, again, when you think about it intellectually, it sounds really grim. But when you experience it, when you are present in that experience, grounded in Dhamma, there's an incredible peace that fills the room and the heart. It doesn't mean that we don't have those feelings of loss. When we, when we lose someone, especially if it's someone that we have a lot of contact with, there's certainly that layer of readjustment that's inevitable. You know, you talk to them every day maybe, and then they're not there. And there's going to be that feeling of, I wish I could tell them. Or that, that feeling of, there's this, this hole, this empty, empty space. And, and that, how do we deal? How do we, how do we address that? You know, it, it's really the same way we address all other kinds of stress, suffering, challenge, dukkha, be open and present to it as it is, experience in the moment, experience in the present moment, knowing that it's impermanent, suffering and not self. And I don't mean that either as like a theory or an intellectual kind of idea. It's an experience to be present with our feelings, regardless really of what they are, and to be able to hold them a little bit away from our, our kind of, um, I think of them as holding them out in front of me. You know, we're standing at the edge of the felt experience, feeling it and seeing it as an object to ourselves. So this is, this is the kind of uh, formula the Buddha gave. This is the first noble truth. You're aware of what you feel and you come to understand it. And you see what the cause of that feeling is. And over time, you let it go. Now, this is another important thing about grief to not ever feel like, well, I should be over this by now, or if I were a better practitioner, I wouldn't have these feelings. That is um, unkind, I feel, to oneself. And I think we, we also shouldn't really be concerned about what other people think of our process. Sometimes people want us to get over it because it's too painful for them and they're not able to be with their feelings. So this idea of being willing to hold whatever we're, what we're experiencing, to step back from it even a little bit if we can, to really put it in a larger context can really help. And this is how we not only manage to walk through the experience, but we also find that it helps us to develop on the path. So the Buddha said that the way we, the way we get through like old kama, things that have come up from the past, is that we get it become, um, we have contact with it again and again, and that's how it resolves. So when the feelings arise, we we look at them. We we. We feel them and we feel them and we observe them with wisdom. And that wisdom is not me, not mine. A changing process. Going through its, its phases and that's okay. And so it's, there can be a lot of um, gentleness surrounding it all kindness towards the other person, towards ourselves, 
the person who's passed away. We can actively do things that are generous and uh, actions that are service to others and dedicate that that goodness, that uh, blessing to the person who's passed away. This is another important way of um, <clears throat> both actually supporting them and healing ourselves. So there are, you know, various um, components. Like I said, one is just the mind having to adjust to the absence of this person and the way that they were in our life. And then there's working with the feelings that arise, and how they change. And if, if we think we should be feeling something that we're not to let that go. Um, I know, I know someone who was very close to me, her brother died and she felt like she should be thinking about him all the time and feeling terrible all the time. And when she didn't, when she was thinking something else, she would come back to it and, and like shame herself because she wasn't as if she, as if that meant she didn't care. Another way that we torture ourselves, <laughs> you know, and it's like, to recognize that that doesn't mean you didn't love them. If you don't have um, an overwhelm of, of grieving feelings, it doesn't mean you didn't care. It's just how it is. It's just the process as it is. We are constantly experiencing the arising of things in this process of our own life that we don't control and we need to Actually, the, the way that we can manage it is to just be present with it, hold it, and not get caught up in moving in, in uh, directions that are unwholesome or unskillful. So this is where wisdom comes in. What's skillful here? And, you know, the, the preparation of reflecting on the nature of life and how it's impermanent is a skillful means. But if that starts to bring, you know, whatever reflection we do, whatever practice we do, if it starts to bring a, 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 a down pulling of the mind, then we want to make some changes because this is the importance of investigating. How are we really doing? You know, and looking at, you know, whether a practice or an approach or a habit that we have is actually bringing about more skillful qualities or and wholesome qualities or bringing about unskillful qualities or mind states. And then adjust. And also when we are... Um, supporting others when they're going through grief to do it from the place of a lot of kindness and tenderness and acceptance, not trying to change their mind about anything, but supporting them in whatever way is appropriate that they've, that they've given you the permission for to see what's wholesome and unwholesome <clears throat> so that they can move in a direction that's healthy and healing. I know there's more that we can talk about with this. And I think I'm gonna leave it to your questions um, and maybe experiences you've had that will um, bring more of the nuances out in this, in this uh, reflection. <coughs> so thank you. Yes, Janaki. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I have. Oh, good. Yeah, good one, Sarnay. 
Um, yes, I also lost my father. He was just 63 years old, so it's not that old. And I suffered for 10 years very intensively. I could never forget that. Um, although I'm, I'm a Buddhist, I mean, by birth and practice, but still nothing helped me. Um, but gradually it came through the understanding um, because I was, I, I felt so much because the, it, it depends upon how attached one is to uh, his or her parents or a loved one. If, yeah. if someone, uh, um, the father or the mother of a friend of mine has passed away, then I wouldn't feel that way. But because it is my father, because I'm so much attached to him. So that's why I felt, uh, um, you know, it was so, so hard for me. <coughs> so, hard. so I thought it is the, the how much I'm attached to him. It's kind of a clinging. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. if I didn't have that part, so probably I wouldn't have um, uh, felt it that way. And also, there's another part that it was a regret. So I was thinking about, uh, I should have done this, I should have done that. When he asked me to come and see him, I could not go there. And he asked me to do this, and I could not do that. So likewise, so I was thinking of all those things which I couldn't yeah. uh, feel. So that made me feel much worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But, yeah, so gradually then I then under, uh, I try to think, okay, yes, um, because of my strong attachment to my father, I am feeling this way, I feel so sad. But the thing yeah. is, I should understand that everything is subject to change and uh, we lose everything um, because due to the anicca, dukkha, anatta, so... Yeah. It is the, the law of nature. So I have to realize that I, I must face it. But the, yes, I understand that the meaning of all those words, but the most difficult part for me was to let go of that attachment. Although yeah. with the time now it has become lessened, but, yeah. um, but still I'm not saying that I'm completely rid of that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Johnny Key. I think you've brought up two important points that I would love to cover. One is this idea of regret. And this is something that I really feel we can create regrets out of any situation. Uh, it, it's very easy to find something that we feel we could have done better because when you, when you say, am I doing enough? Or the answer is always no. And I think this is something to really guard ourselves against. Because, you know, like I, I was with my mom taking care of her during, and living with her the last months before she died. And I tried my level best to do everything that I could in the best way I could. And there are still things that could have been done better. And I think this is something we should tell to talk to ourselves about. You know, there's always this positive. I can always generate regret. I can think about those things that you know, and the, and it's never possible to do it all, or to make sure that the whole process unfolds. Um, you know, people can have a very definite ideas about how they want their death to go or how they would love to have the caretaking of someone else, how they want that to go. And it doesn't go that way. <laughs> Oftentimes, you know, it's, it's a real mess and we can't control all that. And, and when, when those regrets arise, it's useful to talk to ourselves about all of the things that we did do, all of the ways that we did help, all of the ways that we did care for this person one way or another, even if we couldn't visit, we thought of them. Even if we couldn't, you know, do, do exactly the thing that they wish we could do or that we wished we could do, we are caring for them. Now, the other point you made about attachment, this is important. 
This is part of our practice, to love without that attachment, to develop our ability to love someone without the attachment part, which means more and more and more our love for others becomes metta, not uh, the kind of like um, love with attachment always has some kind of, you know, what am I getting out of it? You know, what am I relying on here? Um, you know, this is this is a different kind of feeling as we develop our own stability in life and our own stability of the mind, our own stability in the practice, and our ability to love without requirements from the other person. When we love like that, the letting go is easier because the we see that the death is not the limitation. You know, it's, it's really um, the way that we can really be present with whatever occurs for that person and still care. I hope that makes sense. Nichi? Can I ask Nikki to unmute, please? Nikki, okay. Thank you. Can you unmute yourself, Nikki? Yeah. You I yeah. kept putting, <laughs> kept muting myself. So there might be something in that. Um, thank you. I tried, to, uh, I tried to pronounce your name as if it was Polly. <laughs> <laughs> posh. Sounded posh when you said it like a French even. I know. Uh, it's the spelling. Thank you for your talk and, and the meditation. Thank you. Um, the, when you were talking about grief, I lost my dad too. I guess we all lose our dads at some point. That's the nature of it. Um and there was a bit of complexity. Well, aren't they all complex? Maybe I hadn't seen him for twenty-one years, and so um, and it was just before lockdown in, in the UK. It was just around there, but um, I did go and see him before he died because, in the back of my mind, I thought I better go and see my parents before they die. <laughs> Mm -hmm. just like that a thought like that and then um so I went to see them and um and because I'd already been practicing um the dharma and things like that about five years I know uh, and other stuff you know my my personal growth mm -hmm. is that I noticed it was really weird I noticed that they hadn't changed but I had and so but what hadn't changed was my love for them. Mm. That's what I did notice was that I still loved um, them both dearly. But actually, that's what caused the pain when yeah. I left them. Anyway, so I sort of did. I did my sort of um, didn't talk about all anything, but how much I wanted them to know how much I loved them. Anyway, so I left, and then three months later, he died. And then lockdown came down and it was all that sort of stuff started happening. But what, oh, yeah, so the, the, the complexity of that was the, um, the, it was the loss of my dad uh, because the things he was saying, like, oh, don't make it so long. And I thought, well, you're not going to be another 21 years before, you know, you won't last yeah. that. And then, <laughs> and, then he, and then the other bit was the more painful bit was the loss of what could have been. That's what kept floating into my mind in the grief was like, oh, God, that was painful of because of situations I couldn't um, have a relationship with them. Yeah. So that's the bit that really caused pain. And there wasn't a lot I could do with that. But I did have wise friends around me who kept reminding me, you went to see him, you went to yeah. see him. And that was the bit that was, it didn't necessarily, um, none of it helped in the moment. It was in reflection that I started to see that this was helping. I think I did better than um, my siblings or five of them. I think because of uh, the Dharma actually, because they were all going, why? And I'm thinking, well, why oh. not? 
Yeah. Was, oh, you know, it was all right. He was ready to go, but they couldn't. They were clinging on to that bit. That's the bit I know. <laughs> they, yeah. they couldn't. You know, he was 84. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, it's all I right. I mean, I've heard people. Yeah, even when people are like in their 90s, uh, people are like, why? It's too soon. Why? <laughs> this is a, it's a bad time. You know, it's, it's always a bad time. <laughs> I know, I yeah. that to them, but yeah, but it was just a reflection that I had. I think it, thank goodness for the um, Dharma and the things like that has helped that process so much. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Nikki. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Still think you're Polly. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. It's true. Um, and I've noticed, like, um, I was coming back to the, pl- the area I grew up in, and I didn't visit that often. And my grandmother had just gone to the hospital, and I insisted on stopping to see her on the way from the airport. Uh, because I had that really strong feeling that I had to see her and she died that night. And um, this ha- happens so often, you know, people come home and then um, I don't know, it's almost like people wait uh, to see them. And, and then it's constant, there's a kind of closure, but then remember that, I mean, I don't know where each of you is with regard to the idea of past lives and future lives and come up, but I'm convinced the Buddha wasn't just making that up or going along with some social convention. He was reporting his own direct experience of seeing how that all happens and knowing his own many, 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 many past lives. And we do have these parents again and again, perhaps. Or we, we will see these people again and again, perhaps. And time and space isn't all that much of an inhibition and even death and other realms to uh, love. And like I said, as our love without attachment develops more and more, replacing love with attachment, then it really is boundless. And we, when we think of the bigger picture, like the picture of lifetimes, and then by the time you're 84 or even 69 or who knows what age, it may be the right time to go on to the next phase. And when we can think about that and, and you know, in our minds, in our hearts, in our actions even, you know, support them to go on to the next phase. And you know, wish them all the benefits and happiness and opportunities to be exposed to the Dhamma and practice. And, and yeah, isn't it the case that, you know, you've changed, but they haven't changed. (laughs) I mean, my relationship with my mother was very challenging for me and I tried to get her to change and it didn't work. (laughs) Big surprise. (laughs) I was the one who had to change in order to be at peace and and accepting um, of her the way she was. And by the time she passed away, um, I had said everything that I could say, that I would want to say. And it's good to prepare for these things. We never know. Don't don't pass up an opportunity to tell someone (laughs) something good about them or something good about how you feel about them. Don't pass up the chance to ask for forgiveness. Now, this is a very important thing. And it's really woven throughout the Buddha's teachings, you know, to really, really keep the slate clean. Be ready to go anytime. You know, there's this practice in in the Dhamma, in, in the suttas, where before you go to sleep at night, you think about all the things that could kill you. <laughs> and when you wake up in the morning, you think of all the things that could kill you during the day. <laughs> and you make yourself ready, you know. <laughs> and it also helps us to be ready for what might happen to someone else. And so when we have the bigger, bigger, bigger picture, it really does, does help. Like, did you ever like drive through 
a neighborhood where there's a lot of houses, you can think, you know, every person in every house here is going to die. Everyone. You'd think we'd be more used to it, <laughs> really. Um, and, and it's completely okay. It's completely all right. Death isn't a problem. Violence is a problem. Hatred is a problem. And any, any shred of ill will we may have, we want to try to work that through and let that go because that's a problem. But death itself, even accidents, even if someone kills you, that's not your problem. That's their problem. <laughs> so just a few more ideas around, around that. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Janaki. Kind of got muted. Janaki, it, it unmuted for a second and then it muted. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Aya. Um, I just thought that um, if I um, do the invoking of blessings and transferring of merits to uh, to the to all the departed uh, relatives, I mean, including my father and mother, and uh, the other members uh, of the family. So uh, I took that as a as a um, as one of the means to get rid of my uh, grief. So it helps, but I don't know whether I, uh, these really help uh, because uh, maybe I'm doing that thinking that those will help them rather than myself but i really want that, that to help myself as well yeah. so i don't know whether i'm cheating myself or not <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so this is a very good question and the, like the way you said it to help you to help get over the grief <laughs> yeah we we want to know we want to be clear in our intention and we want to be clear about our underlying desires because it's not about us feeling better. It's about really wishing them well. It's about really uh, giving them support. You know, some, there was a man who came to the Buddha and said, does it really help um, to, you know, like chant these blessings and give these things to make merit for the departed ones? And the Buddha said, well, it depends. Okay. It depends on where they are, because in some realms, they really can't receive much of benefit. But in other realms, they really can benefit. Because if you get reborn as a human, if your family is wishing you well, it's probably not going to make that much difference in your human birth. But if you're in a realm like the hungry ghost realm, he said it can make a lot of difference. And so the man said, well, what if my relative didn't go to the hungry ghost realm? And then the Buddha said, well, it'll help your other relatives that are in the hungry ghost realm. He said, what if I don't have any relatives in the hungry ghost realm? He said, absolutely everyone has relatives in the hungry ghost realm. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's what you don't even, you don't have to think about what that's like or anything, but just your heart opening and caring and wanting to <coughs> share the blessings of your life and share the abundance of your life and and share the the efforts of your mind and your and your physical and verbal actions this is this is enough you know and our practice our very practice anything that we do to purify our own mind and develop on the path this also helps others and we can share that merit but it is important to really be honest with ourselves and it's okay if if i discover oh there's really this 
also selfish intention, then what do we do? It's not to blame ourselves and feel like, oh, bad girl, I just should not act like that, think like that. No, it's more like, wow, there's something there that needs some support. I can give myself some support. You know, it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry if we are there present with it and work it through and not act on things in a way that's harmful in any way to others or ourselves, but to really just acknowledge this is how it is. This is how it is. And by taking care of these feelings and understanding where they're rooted, I can let them go. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Jaya. Sad, You're welcome. Sad. Thank you, Janaki. James. James. Are you there, James? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, this is not so much about grief, but more, you know, about the process of dying and everything. It's, um, uh, I guess for some reason I have this belief that um, the attitude you bring, you know, when, when you're dying yourself can actually shape the experience of the process, that it can make it more easy or more difficult if, if you have a <laughs> of acceptance and of letting go then I, I think at the end it could be a lot easier and less sort of drawn out and painful. That's that's my thought. I'm not quite sure where that came from. But um, but I have a female relative who is so not like that, doesn't accept things, always holds on, holds grudges, stresses, holds on to fears and everything. And I can't help thinking that, well, she's quite old now, that when the end comes, it could make things a lot more difficult than they could be. And that worries me. I'm not quite sure what to do with that, you know? Yeah. Well, um, I want to first I'll say for the first part, I think your assumption makes sense because we can see how that works in our day-to-day -day life. If I have a, an attitude, the, you know, depending on my attitude, my morning's going to go better or worse, you know, or my whatever, you know. So I think it makes total sense that our attitude towards death, which is, you know, one of one of the benefits of reflecting on, you know, aging, sickness, and death, and and all of the the rest of it that the Buddha encouraged. That's that's one of the reasons we go into it knowing, yeah, this is a natural process and. I can, I can be kind through this process to everyone around me and I can, you know, just go, okay, now we've got this to deal with and that's okay. We're going to go through it and it'll be all right. That's going to help a lot. Now about your relative, we don't know how that's going to go for someone else. Sometimes in the clenches, something else comes in and lifts a person up and they don't have the same habit that they had all their life. It can be amazing. <clears throat> Maybe she'll die in her sleep. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, um, you just don't know um, what it's going to be like. And it's their karma. Whatever it is, it comes from causes and conditions. And the best we can do uh, standing by is to be as kind and supportive as we can. But in anyone's life, no matter who they are, or how close they are to us, we can't change them. And you know that, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but we can't change them. And we can't really mitigate their karma. They have to do that. And they have to, they have to be responsible for their own freedom from suffering. And we can be a good example in their life. Um, 
We can share things when it's appropriate about the Dhamma, about the practice, but can't force anything on them. And we just have to accept that, yeah, everybody around us is suffering. This is so this is the nature of this realm. And we can help a little here and there, but it comes down to the individual, you know, really taking it on to want to change ourselves. Yeah. Try not to worry. It probably won't unfold the way you think. Very little does. <laughs> I think I just need to learn more kindness, compassion, and patience between now and then. So I'll work on that. And yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's a great opportunity. Kindness, compassion, and patience. Working on that is never going to go the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. Yeah, surely. Surely. Um, yeah, on a got quite a different tack, really. Can you hear me all right? Yes, thank loud you. and clear. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. I have the talk, and the, it's a it's a big big topic. Um, and thank you for the meditation. Uh, what I wanted to ask, it's about, it's about compassion for the sufferings of the world, which at times can seem quite overwhelming. And I was having this conversation in a, in a Dhamma group. It was about climate change. It was about the emotions that are evoked by climate change. And I said, that grief is the near enemy of compassion. And the person, which I don't know whether I don't, but and then the person said, no, it's not, it's pity. I think it's, it's, it's semantics in a way. Um, but I've been pondering over that because I realized that I was sort of numbing out on my grief because I felt it wasn't a Buddhist response and I ought to be. Mm. So I wasn't actually opening up to my grief and I needed to do that. Um, but it's the, it, it's, I've been contemplating this when somebody told me a very sad story. It's a personal story. And it was very painful to listen to. But I realized that I actually wasn't suffering. It wasn't a suffering. I wasn't suffering. I was feeling the pain and it's, um, th there's a thing, I think Anukampa is a quivering of the heart and I think Karuna is the wish to help relieve sufferings, if I'm correct. But it is, there is a quivering of the heart. Um, there is a sort of, you feel the you do feel the pain because it's not a pleasant thing to witness, but the compassion itself can be sweet. So I've just been, I wondered if you could just say a few words about um, yeah grief and, and 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 compassion and this sort of quivering, this sort of quivering <clears throat> heart when you actually open up to the suffering of the world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Shirley. It's a very important point. So it is true that sadness is a near enemy of compassion. I'm going to say sadness because grief is sadness. And I think also that process of dealing with the loss um, and both sadness and grief are identified by the Buddha as dukkha, suffering, and to be overcome. So I don't, it's very important what you're saying about not numbing out. We, this, 
we, we cannot tolerate spiritual bypassing in ourselves. If we try to leap over our feelings and kind of shove them into the dark, <clears throat> saying, well, this the right <clears throat> Buddhist response is to be above it all, we're not going to wake up that way. We have to be willing to open up to what we actually feel and experience and be present with it. It is from that position that we see our clean and we can resolve it. It is from that position that we can develop the actual spiritual qualities and the wisdom that helps us to actually experience things differently. You know, like when the mind has come to the full understanding of the Dhamma, an arahant is not going to experience the loss of their sister or their mother or whoever the same way. They're going to know this is natural for them to go on. It's okay. There's no um, <clears throat> residue in, in, in their mind. And until we get to that point, we still moving along in our development, we have like levels of that arising. So, you know, when we look at something as enormous as climate change, we can still step back and see the bigger picture. Now, the Buddha said that the world, the world comes and it goes, and it comes and it goes. The whole universe expands and contracts down to nothing again. And most living beings hang out in this particular kind of deva realm while that's all going on. And then they get reborn again on you know, planets like this. What's the big deal? Yeah, it's really hard to see species going extinct and thinking about what's going to happen to the children that are born these days. And, you know, all those things are really hard, especially from seeing things the way a normal human perspective is, which is kind of down here in the, in the thick of it. And then, like I said, we, spiritual bypassing doesn't work. But to actually be present with all of that and bring wisdom to it more and more. And then, you know, put in the causes and conditions for our own awakening. So that we can really understand what's happening and why it's not a spiritual catastrophe it's it's a worldly catastrophe and there's no end to worldly catastrophe <laughs> it just happens all the time and it's going to keep going because there's greed hatred and delusion and until that's eradicated we're going to keep having these issues and we also can be on the lookout for why human beings are attracted to catastrophe there's something exciting about it and that may be hard to take in with regard to climate change, but look at all the other ways in which human beings like to get into, get into the fray and mix it up. You know, and we got to notice that if that's arising in ourselves because the Buddha is like, you know, all this stuff we chase after in the world, it disturbs our peace. It's never satisfying. If we let it all go, if we see the downside, pretty soon all we want is real peace. And then as we develop in that way, we become an example in the world, a point of an oasis of peace, a, a point of, of light. And and when we're when we're in what your point, Shirley, when we are cultivating compassion yes you have the desire to help to relieve the suffering of others you have the desire for you have the wish for that suffering to end for living beings but it doesn't bring down your own heart if if it does it's not true compassion whether it's karuna or anakampa anakampa does have that root of trembling 
But the truth is when we're working with Anakampa or, or Karuna, it does not bring down the heart. The word Anakampa is generally used in the suttas and in the Vinaya when there's an action involved. Like when we request ordination, the word is anukampa. And it's to like say to the person who can ordain you out of this understanding that you have of the thirst that I have to be ordained, please take this action. But that's not a down pulling of the heart. That's a, that's a <clears throat> request or an acknowledgement of action. That's how I see it. Thank you. That's helpful. It is. It was very. It was very interesting when I was listening to this lady's very tragic story, which was mm -hmm. very painful. But I actually felt. I sort of felt uplifted because I was able to open my heart. Yeah. So it was. It was. It, 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 it was. It was interesting. But I, yeah. I, as I say, I wasn't depressed by it. I wasn't pulled down by it. Mm -hmm. But there was this. Yeah. Oh, ouch. Yeah. 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 Ouch. There's so many, so many things that happen to human beings, and so many things human beings do that are, oh God. <laughs> you know, but. Um, you know, we have to know our own minds and whatever will pull them down into um, <clears throat> sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Um, we want to know why it does that because there's something unresolved in my own heart. If that's so, this is this is why we often feel the pangs of grief when it, there's a new loss because of the grief of the past that's been unresolved. It brings up all the what's unresolved. And, you know, like after my father died, my mother said whenever she, someone else in the community's husband passed away, she said, now I really feel so much compassion for them because I know what they have to go through. Not that everybody's situation is the same, but, you know, she, she said before I felt sorry for them, but I didn't really get it. So when we have loss, we, we get it. And, you know, like Janaki said, you know, we feel the loss of our own relative and we don't have the same feeling for the person down the street that we hardly know. But eventually in a practice, we have the same feeling, whether it's my loss or your loss, because none of it's mine anyway. And when there's a tragic loss, especially through violence, it hurts us all, I think. It's, there is a, a, a sense there of how wrong that is, and yet an acceptance that this is the nature of this realm. And as far as natural death goes, yeah, that's how things are. It's okay. Well, I think we've hit the limit. I just wanna thank you for your sharing um, and everyone's <clears throat> attention and heart and practice. Um, there is a beautiful way forward in life. I have unmuted again because it's my duty to say thank you to Aya. And I'm sorry, my question made us run a little bit over time. But no. okay. um, and just to say that uh, these sessions are freely given, the Dhamma is freely given. And um, we are part of Anatha. It's nice that we Anakampa and Karuna, these two monasteries, these two mm. beautiful monasteries. Mm. And uh, <laughs> uh, I would like to, I think Matthias is going to put something in the chat box, the link to uh, if you want to make a donation to um, 
uh, the, uh, the new Anakampa Monastery that has just been purchased, which is with such wonderful news. And yeah, we're think, so excited for yes, you all. Yes, so it's very, very exciting. And also, I think Matthias is going to put a link to the Karuna Bihar, Buddhist Bihara, if you want to read about that. And uh, maybe you might want to make a donation to that as well. So that there's, 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 there's opportunities. So um, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, yes, yeah. so thank you, Aya. You're very welcome. Look forward to Take seeing care, you. everyone. Yeah.